Last week, we finished up in uh, Malachi chapter 2 with the words, Malachi 2 verse 17, where we saw the words there that uh, Yahweh said to this ecclesia, you have wearied Yahweh with thy words. And that's a very definite and decisive statement from Yahweh. God was no longer prepared to continue an unprofitable discussion with this ecclesia, with people who were averse to hearing the wise counsel of their God and unwilling to attempt to correctly discern the purpose of God in their lives. Throughout this discourse, Yahweh has been revealed. Throughout the book of Malachi, he's been revealed as being very patient, as being very loving towards the ecclesia and very tender. But he's also shown that he's an admonishing God and a commanding God. All attempts by Yahweh to draw the priests and the people back had been not only resisted, but they'd been openly challenged. So in this verse 17 of chapter 2, we have the fifth of eight challenges they make to Yahweh. Wherein have we wearied him? God says... When ye say that everyone that doeth evil is good in the sight of Yahweh, and he delighteth in them, or when you say, as it says in verse 17, where is the God of judgment? They openly justified sin and sinners. Openly justified it. They saw sin as something that God might actually even approve. The Jerusalem Bible says any evildoer is good as far as Yahweh is concerned. That's Jerusalem Bible's rendering of verse 17. So as in the days of Isaiah, many of the ecclesias had little idea of true moral and spiritual values. Isaiah 5 verse 20 we read, Woe unto them who call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light, and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet, and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes, and prudent in their own sight. Now those words present really an awesome, a tremendous challenge to the ecclesias of God in every generation. Now what happens, ask yourself, what happens when the truth is not clearly and soundly understood. When right values are replaced with wrong ones, well, what happens, we know from Scripture, we're told, the truth begins to die. Firstly, within individuals, then within the ecclesias of which those individuals are members. The light begins to go out. And we're told in scripture that finally Christ will remove the lampstand from out of the midst of the ecclesia and only darkness will remain. In, that's in Revelation 2 verse 5. It's what he told the Ephesian ecclesia. He would remove the lampstand from the midst of the ecclesia. You know, Malachi reveals just such a process of deterioration in that ecclesia. Now, perhaps in the ecclesia the process had been slow. Perhaps it had been very quick. Perhaps it had happened insidiously and deceptively. But it had happened. That's why we have the book of Malachi. So here is the inevitable result. An ecclesia who claimed to be sons and daughters of the living God and yet who failed to understand and practice even the basic principles of God's doctrine. And then we have the final indignity which they heaped upon their God, and it was to challenge him. To challenge the fact is whether he would ever, even ever act to bring judgment upon them. Where is the God of judgment? Well, that is one of the key statements of the book of Malachi. Because the rest of Malachi's words now are devoted to answering that question, as we said last week. So chapter 3 starts with this word. Chapter 3 at verse 1 starts with the word, Behold. Now it's a very dramatic command from God. He says, 
be whole. Behold, it's working. Behold, do you want an answer to your question, he says? you want an answer to that question, where is the God of judgment? Well, he's saying, behold, start to listen to me. Open your eyes to what is actually going to follow, and I'll show you, I'll tell you where the God of judgment is. He says to them, I will... Use the arrow I will send my messenger, he says. Now that phrase... There's a direct quotation from Isaiah 40, verse 3. And it indicates that the messenger would be the one who would be promised in Isaiah 40, John the Baptist. And God spoke in John, and it's a very important prophecy concerning John the Baptist as the forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I will send my messenger. We saw from one of our earlier studies, messenger is the word malak. It means to dispatch. Yahweh will dispatch a messenger. It means specifically a, God of, a messenger of God. And malak is where Malachi's name comes from. So he's going to dispatch this messenger. John chapter 1 verse 6, we read, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Now, I've, Scripture's showing us here that this, this, this quote in John chapter 1 verse 6 is in direct fulfilment of that prophecy that Malachi quotes from, from Isaiah 40 verse 3. It's in direct fulfilment of that prophecy. The messenger was to come, and his message was that Christ was to be manifested. So John the Baptist not only prophesied or foretold that Christ was about to come, he also condemned the moral decadence and the religious hypocrisy of that generation. It's the same generation as Christ was fits into. So he fits aptly into this theme of the book. Who may abide the day of his coming? Is it going to be those who haven't taken the time to get themselves ready? Is it going to be those who treat lightly their moral obligations to God? Will it be those who are in ignorance of or who rest the truth of God's word? Will it be those who show apathy and indifference and don't care really whether they actually set about to please God or not? Are they going to be ready to abide the day of his coming, of the Lord's coming? Well, absolutely not. John's message was a call to individual responsibility before God. And so is Malachi's. It's a call to individual responsibility from each and every one of us. So Malachi says here in chapter 3 and verse 1 that this messenger was going to prepare the way. So how did he do that? How did he prepare the way for the Lord? Well, he sent a basic message, very basic message. All flesh is grass. And those four words in English represent the basic message of, of John. In Isaiah 40, again, at verses 6 and 8, it's, we read, The voice said, Cry. And he said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. The word of our God shall stand forever. So in other words, the basic message is, you're not going to last very long in this life, unless you dedicate your life to being pleasing and acceptable to Almighty God, so that you might have a life beyond this present existence. It's exactly what John preached. He preached concerning the weakness and the constitution of flesh and the need that mankind has to heed the wise words of God, that they might rise above the flesh and obtain eventually to the glory of divine nature. So Malachi says there, in that first verse of chapter 3, he says, The Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple. So that really then is an ironic answer to their question. They said rather contemptuously, Where is the God of judgment? Did they, did they actually seek this God? No. The question is, really, should have been, would they be ready to meet him and to face up to the judgment 
that he's going to administer. Those brethren who so impatiently ask, where is the God of judgment, should have been asking themselves quite seriously if they were prepared for such a judgment. It's a question we must ask ourselves, brothers and sisters. Are we actually prepared right now for Christ's return, if he returns tomorrow, to stand before him at the judgment seat and answer for all our actions, both here for ourselves personally, for our families within the ecclesia? Are we prepared for that? You know, Malachi says that he shall suddenly come to his temple. In Leviticus, we read, and this is quite an important point and a wonderful point that Malachi makes here. We read that I will set my tabernacle among, among you and I will walk among you and will be your God and ye shall be my people. And you find that the Apostle Paul quotes that too in 2 Corinthians 6. He says, For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. So Christ came to his temple literally and figuratively because we are to be the temple of the living God. And here we find him described in this verse as the messenger of the covenant. The messenger of the covenant. But in this instance, in Malachi, he's not referring to the Mosaic, Mosaic covenant, but to the Abrahamic covenant. Therefore, it's a reference to the, to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, and we know Christ there. Describes them as the mediator of the new covenant. Now, in, in Hebrews there, it's called the new covenant, not because it's new in a literal sense, but because... It was new in relation to the Mosaic as far as the Israelite was concerned. But that work still remains to be completed at his second advent. Here in chapter 3 and verse 1 of Malachi, he refers to the messenger of the covenant and he says, whom ye delight in. You know, these people delighted in him so much that they queried at the end of chapter 2 whether he would, even, whether he would ever appear. That's how much they delighted in him. But we actually must learn to delight in those things. We, we have to make sure, as we are so close to Christ's return, we have to make sure that our delight is in God, that our delight is actually in serving Christ in the way that he has shown us. He, he is actually, or should be, our life. We should make sure that his purpose is our purpose, that his cause is our cause. So that we might be, as we've said several times through the study, be a people that are prepared for the Lord's return. So in verse 2 then of this chapter, we see that we come to the theme of the studies. Who may abide the day of his coming? Now see, they, these once again are rather ironic words here because instead of asking themselves the question, where's the God of judgment? And they should have been asking themselves, who may abide the day of his coming. The word abide here actually means to endure. And in Rotherham's, it's rendered, but who may endure the day of his coming? It's not simply to abide, but to endure. So what he's saying, in other words, is who's going to survive that time? That time of judgment. It's what he's saying there. Who's going to endure? Who's going to actually survive that time? He goes on to say in that verse, who shall stand when he appeareth? Or as Rotherham says, who will be justified by him? So what it's actually saying to us, who's going to survive that time and who will be justified by him? So, because, he says, and he continues and he says, because he's like a refiner's fire. He's starting to describe the judgment seat for us now. He's like a refiner's fire and he's like full of soap. Now, we probably all know that a refiner's purpose was to light a fire under the metal. He'd heat the metal in a vessel and then when it heated up, the dross would come to the top and he'd scoop off all the dross. So... The purpose of the fire was to remove all the dross, leaving only the pure metal behind. So 
Now we've got who's going to endure the fire of judgment. So the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 12 to 13, If any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, everything, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work for what it is. So he's telling us there that all the things that are in our lives that we might consider really quite important, they're nothing more than wood, hay and stubble. They're combustible, they're of no value whatsoever when we stand at that judgment seat. Those things we might consider important today are going to be swept away in the fire of judgment when the Lord Jesus Christ comes to establish his kingdom. And the only things that will survive that time will be gold and silver and precious stones. Gold in scripture, as we probably know, is the symbol for faith. Silver is the symbol for redemption. So gold, as we see, is silver for faith. So what he's telling us here, that the dross that's left in our lives... Christ is going to burn away because that part of our life is not worthy of the kingdom. What will be left will be the spiritual life, the gold, the silver, and the precious stones that we have built into our character. So we're almost, in essence, we're going to stand, be stripped naked and stand before Christ at that judgment seat, and the only thing we will have will be our character that we've built in our probation, our spiritual life, the gold, the silver and the precious stones. So no, it's wonder that Malachi says there that he will be like full as soap. And that's an interesting expression, full as soap, because it's actually as full as alkali, as Rotherham's and other places render it. And it's typifying a cleansing from spiritual and moral defilement. So it's a veg vegetable alkali, and that term only occurs here in Malachi and one other time in Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 22. So Christ will, in effect, for that nation of Israel in the times that have come, and you should really note the power of these references that are here, because what it's doing is telling us that Christ here, step by step, is being revealed to Israel. And the God of judgment will come. And when he does, we're told in verse 3, in reading from the Jerusalem Bible, verse 3, it says, He will take his seat as refiner and purifier. He will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver so that they can make the offering to Yahweh with uprightness. So see what it's telling us there? Refiner is at his work. The refiner sits there with his attention focused on his work. Yahweh's a refiner. He's there with his focus upon his work. That's us. And he's carefully, the refiner carefully watches the whole process. And that refiner will increase the heat whenever it's necessary. Yes, we go through trials, we go through tribulation. The heat is turned up from time to time. Then finally, the refiner will complete his work and, and the completed work will remove from the fire. So we said silver is the symbol for redemption. So the symbology here is applied nationally to Israel's coming restoration. But we have to remember, brothers and sisters, that judgment begins first at the house of God. So therefore we also must go through this final refining process before the Lord Jesus Christ makes us ready for divine nature and for the kingdom of God. So here in verse 3 Malachi says, when Messiah comes, that the tree, tribe of Levi is going to be purified, that everything's going to change. This generation, this generation that has sinned before him and that denies the principles of God's truth, that perverts his way, will have been swept into the dust of time. And then there will be a generation that the messenger of the covenant, the Lord Jesus Christ, will purify when he comes to purify the sons of Levi. And it says here that he's going to purge them as gold. You know, so we have this, this term gold used for faith. Well, Israel in the age to come can only be purified 
and brought into the kingdom in a mortal state upon the same principles as we are brought into the truth today. They are going to have to be purged as gold. They're going to have to learn to develop a faith in what was accomplished in their Lord and their Saviour some 2,000 years ago. They're going to have to admit to their wrongdoing. So we see in verse 3 that they can offer, make the offering to Yahweh with uprightness. As Rotherham says, offering a gift in righteousness. It's a wonderful thing because it's speaking of the offerer and what they offer and their moral char characteristics of a rejuvenated nation. So then God says, and only then, in verse 4, as he starts verse 4, he says, then, so then and only then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant. Reading from Rotherham's verse 4, Then shall the gift of Judah and Jerusalem past times and as in the ancient years. And this is the only time in the AV that this word is translated as pleasant. And the primary idea behind it is to braid or to intermix and to be interwoven. So what we have here is a picture. We have God with his perfection of character and his purpose and then we have man now with his pure offering. And they are interwoven together as one. So they cleave together and they become as one. So in that way, it's how we can become one with God. So the test for us, for every offering, must always be, will it be pleasant to God? Will it be according to the principles of his character? And will it be that which he actually requires of us? For us today, if we want to be in the kingdom, if we actually want to be associated with the Lord Jesus Christ in purifying the sons of Levi in that day, we have to learn the principle of God's character and God's requirement what, and whatever we offer must be acceptable to God because he tells us in his word, he tells us how to do that. He tells us what we must do. He tells us the spirit and the disposition that we need and to do it in a way that is acceptable to him. So you notice in the word, it speaks of the purifying of the sons of Levi as in the days of old. And that really... That statement is, is an incredible one, really, because it's there to remind us that the kingdom of God has existed on the earth in the past and that it's going to exist again in the future. Rotherham renders this, as, as we see there before us, that he renders it as in the days of age past times and as in the ancient years. You know, and when we think about that statement, why it's so incredible is that's what makes our faith so real, isn't it? We know about the kingdom of God having existed on the earth in the past. We know what the apostles meant when they said in Acts chapter 1, when they said to the Lord Jesus Christ, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? We know that's real. It's something that we can relate to, and therefore we long for that time. We long for the Lord's return. May it be, brothers and sisters, that our offerings to God in the meantime, as we await, which won't be much longer, I believe, as we prepare for the Lord's return, may it be that our offerings are interwoven with the character of God so that we might be there to relive and to re-establish those days of old. Now verse 5 is very clear. It says in verse 5, judgment. And I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers and against false swearers and against those that oppress the hireling in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, and that turn aside the stranger from his right, and fear not me, saith Yahweh of armies. She starts that verse, he says, I will come. They are very emphatic and very definite words. And there's a very certain and firm and blunt assurance in those three words. I will come. So this is the answer to their question. Where is the God of judgment? Verse 5 says, I will come. And now we have that same assurance. We have the assurance, brothers and sisters, that the Lord Jesus Christ, as the manifestation of his Father, will come. 
But it continues. It says in verse 5, I will come near. Now they're words that are used to express an approach to the altar when one approaches the altar to offer sacrifices. It actually speaks of Yahweh coming near through his messenger, the Lord Jesus Christ, to offer a sacrifice and the sacrifice offered is dealt with in chapter 4 and verse 1. Chapter 4 and verse 1, there's the sacrifice. All the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble, and the day that cometh shall burn them up, that it will leave them neither root nor branch. The wicked, we're told there, are the sacrifice will be offered. God says, I will come near to you to judgment. And these people, in their impudence, had the temerity to ask, where is the God of judgment? You know, in ap apostolic times, the same sort of thing was being said. Brethren led astray from the truth stated, where is the promise of his coming? But God says, I will come, and I will come to be a swift witness against those who are worthy of judgment. So we, also, we read also in verse 5 of a list there of sins, sorcerers, adulterers, false swearers, oppressors of the hireling. And you know, you find every one of those things in the verses of Scripture. Sorcerers are dealt with in Exodus chapter 22, verse 18. Adulterers speaks of them in Exodus 20, verse 14. False swearers, again in Exodus chapter 20, verse 16. Now all the way through, in every case here, Malachi is quoting from a passage of either Exodus or Deuteronomy. So what have we actually got here in verse 5? Well, Reading from the Jerusalem Bible, it says, I'm coming to put you on trial, and I shall be a ready witness against Sarah the widow and the orphan who rob the foreigner of his rights, and do not respect me, says Yahweh Sabaoth. So you might look at that list and you might think to yourself, well, that's good, because I'm not guilty of any of those things. And we probably most of us aren't. But let's have a look and see a little deeper. Because sorcerers, well... We don't practice sorcery in the ecclesial world today, do we? But do you know what sorcery really is? Sorcery is nothing more than religious deception. So anyone who preaches that which is wrong, contrary to divine commandments, as those priests were in the days of Malachi, is guilty of sorcery. So what about adulterers? Well, we know that it's speaking of a moral issue here, but... It's also true that according to James chapter 4, verse 4, that if we're disloyal to Christ, if we're unfaithful to him, if we have friendships with the world, then we are guilty of spiritual adultery. And adultery is a moral matter, yes, but it's not just simply a moral matter, it's a spiritual matter as well. So what about perjurers? Well, that's a token of untrustworthiness. Can God trust us? to handle his word honestly, ethically, and with absolute integrity? Or are we perhaps sometimes a little untrustworthy in his eyes? What about oppressing the hireling? Well, that speaks of selfishness. Are we selfish at the expense of others, of our brothers, our sisters, maybe our husbands or our wives? What about widows and fatherless? It's in the list. Well, what's that speak of? What's the essence of that? Well, it's talking about taking advantage of those who cannot help themselves. It's a disregard for the need of maybe the helpless amongst us, the little ones, the weak ones amongst us. And it's very important that we never practice that in an ecclesia, isn't it? What about turning aside the stranger? What's the principle of that? Well, it's denying the rights of others because self somehow always managed to get its place first. And we must never do that either. We know that, but it happens. And then there's the seventh point. They that fear not or disrespect Yahweh. That signifies those who have no deep-rooted, humble reverence for God or for his truth. So it, Yahweh lists seven sins here. And seven as we probably know, is the number for completeness. And those seven sins embody all the weaknesses that can be manifested in our spiritual lives. Seven sins which, if we allow them to come from the kingdom, 
They are seven forms of iniquity that are in complete contrast to the character of Almighty God. Now, you should read those words very, very carefully, brothers and sisters, and read them not only as literal sins and literal moral problems, because they exist, because those things, those things listed there, are the very things which are corrupting and destroying our society today and destroying ecclesias today. And they've got to be at all cost kept out of the ecclesia, not only literally as the sins they're lifted, listed there, but in their spiritual meaning in the ecclesia. So those sins do not reflect God manifestation within the ecclesia. They represent self-seeking, self-indulgence and selfish living. And we know that every generation in which the ecclesia has existed, there's always been a, a need to fight the influence of an apostate world and to keep it out of the ecclesia of God. And we must, all of us, be watchmen and do our part in that regard. You know, the prophet continues in verse 6. And he gives great encouragement here. He says to in verse 6, those people that are numbered over in verse 16, those who fear Yahweh and thought and spoke often upon his name, he says in verse 6 that they can be now encouraged because he says, for I am Yahweh. I change not. Therefore ye sons of Jacob are not, as it should be rendered properly, utterly consumed. So first and foremost in verse 6 is the covenant name by which Israel could identify their God and set him apart from every other God. I am Yahweh. And the very fact that the covenant name is used here is an assurance of God's fidelity, of his honesty, of his trustworthiness and the fact that he will never fail to keep his covenant. And he utters these magnificent words which we can be you know, eternally grateful for when he says, I change not. You know, it's incredible really when you think of the evil that comes from the heart of man. The evil that comes from the heart of man and was catalogued for us then in verse 5 that we just went through. Then in verse 6, we have this sharp and pure contrast with the words of God. He says, I change not. You know, we don't deal with a capricious God, one who may accept us today and then get angry with us and reject us tomorrow for no real reason or, or no real need. God says he changes not. And that's what our hope is based upon. That's the hope that we have. What he has promised, he will actually deliver. Therefore, if Yahweh is unchangeable, and if we desire to be identified with him, then once we've learned the truth, we dare not, dare not change from the purity of the faith into which we are baptised. God doesn't change. Therefore, if we change, we do so at our peril, the peril of our eternal life. The covenant name which was first proclaimed at a time when Yahweh was about to reveal his power for the deliverance of his people is here given as an assurance of the fact that God will never change. And now that's a wonderful thing, to know that we deal with a God who can be totally and can be utterly trusted, that he will not in any sense whatsoever, in any sense, change from what he is. So now in verse 7, the subject changes. We have, even from the days of your fathers, in verse 7 we read, even from the days of your fathers ye have gone away from mine ordinances and have not kept them. He says, return unto me and I will return unto you. So see what Yahweh's saying to them there and what he's saying to us? He, he had never gone away from them. They had gone away from their God. Now they're dreadful words. They're words of tragedy for the ecclesia. The, the RV renders them more correctly that ye are turned aside. Now we all know that we have a, set before us a road, a straight road, and we know that if we go down that road, it's going to take us directly to the kingdom of God because Yahweh has set that road before us. We have all the directions. We have the spiritual and the moral compass. But Malachi says to them here, ye have turned aside. They had continued to treat lightly their obligations to God and to his truth. So he says to them, ye have gone away from mine ordinances. Now he's speaking about apostasy within the ecclesia itself. You have not kept the things that I've set before you, says God in his appeal to them. God actually requires obedience, and he doesn't, not just mere theoretical knowledge. 
And in actual fact, these people in Malachi's day, they had neither. They gave to God neither of those things. But you see, having theoretical knowledge doesn't necessarily be able to follow that straight road that leads to the kingdom of God. But he says to them these wonderful words. He says to them, if you return unto me, I will return unto you. Now, I've got this PowerPoint up, came a bit early, but have a look at Zechariah 1 verse 3. And we notice there the origin of these words that Malachi has taken from Zechariah. Therefore say unto them, thus saith Yahweh of armies, Turn you unto me, saith Yahweh of armies, and I will turn unto you, saith Yahweh of armies. So three times the militant title is spoken of here for a reason. What Yahweh is saying to them is if, if you will turn unto me, then I will fight your enemies, hence the use of the militant title and why he stressed it three times. Turn unto me, I will fight your enemies, I will deliver you from all the trials and the tribulations of life. So we have to move towards God to show that we desire to receive the grace of God, to show that we have a, a love for our God, to show that we have respect and reverence for the word of God. Because it's the word of God that prompts us and moves us in the direction of our God in the same way that it prompts us and motivates us on that straight and narrow road that leads to the kingdom. So how tragic is it then that in verse 7 here, Yahweh pleads for his people to hear his voice. His voice had gone forth through Moses and down through the prophets, down through century after century after century of time. Later, it goes forth through the Lord Jesus Christ and the apostles, and that same voice cries out to us today. In these closing days of the Gentiles, it cries out to us and we must hear that voice and we must draw near to our God while we still have the opportunity. You know, tomorrow even could be too late. But these people we find, they ask once again, they challenge God again. Verse 7, wherein shall we return? So what are they saying? They're saying, well, what do you mean? We haven't gone anywhere. We've been here all the time. What do you actually mean by that? So the six of their challenges to God's word. He says to them, return unto me, I'll return unto you. And they say, wherein shall we return? Contemptuous once again. They had no knowledge, they had no understanding of what it was that God required of them. A blindness to their own state, a blindness to their sins, and insufficient of God's word within them to cause them to respond. Now we must never ever allow ourselves to be caught up in such a situation. It's why we need the vision of the kingdom of God. That's why we have we emphasise from the platform and, and when we talk to people to need to daily draw upon the word of God for the building up of our spiritual life, for our spiritual being. It's almost like saying to ourselves, when these people say to him, where and shall we return? It's almost like us saying, well, what are you talking about? We go to the meeting every Sunday? What more do you want of us? We're there every Sunday morning. Well, we just simply cannot afford an attitude like that. It's as though we're saying, well, an appearance at the memorial meeting on a Sunday morning and the ritual of the partaking of the bread and wine, that's all that God requires. We're own to do as we want. We must never allow that because our whole life should be a life of dedication to God. It should be a life of separation from the world. It should be a life of reverence for his word, a feeding upon that word and a desire to be interwoven, to be at one with God. Return unto me is the plea that he makes to them. In spite of everything, hear from God for them was an offer of love and fellowship. You know, may it be brothers and sisters, that we never get into the position where we feel that our God has deserted us. Because God will just never do that. God will never desert us. He will never forsake us. It always happens the other way around. We desert God. We do that when we repudiate the truth. We do that when we fail to honour his name and his word. We do it when we fail to recognise the love and the mercy and the goodness that he extends towards us. That's how we go away from God. Love and fellowship 
is not an automatic thing. It actually requires a, spon a response from us as well. It requires that brothers and sisters open their eyes to what the truth is so that they can recognise their true position, that they recognise their true need, which is something we have to do every day of our lives, to be able to understand the terms and conditions that God lays down and the means by which that can be done. I am Yahweh, I change not. Now if he changes not, that means that the terms and conditions under which we were brought into covenant relationship with him, which involves our eternal salvation and our service to him, our terms and our conditions do not change. They never change. We can't change them, and that's why God finds it now necessary to remind this ecclesia, this nation in verse 8. He says to them, Will a man rob God? And robbers, as primary root word means to defraud. So they not only departed from the way that leads to Almighty God, but they had robbed him as well. And the idea behind the use of this word is to try and hide away from God that which is rightfully his, to keep back as though hiding it in such a way that God can't see it, so that he won't miss it and he won't know that they haven't given it. So they'd not only departed, but they'd robbed him as well. And you know, we have to ask ourselves the question, would we or could we rob God? You know, that's a sin that is far older than the law of Moses. It's a sin that dates back to the dawn of history because Cain was one who robbed God. Cain not off, only off, offered only rendered what he thought God might be pleased with, what he thought was good enough. You know, the heart of a man becomes alienated from God when there's no longer a strong and urgent desire to do that which is pleasing to God. And when or if this happens, sadly we've already begun the process of robbing God. You now we're robbing God, well actually the very root of the sin is actually back in... Um, In verse 7, so we come to verse 8. We have robbed God when we're holding back and starting to hide away things that really belong to God. Because Yahweh wants our lives. He wants his sons and daughters to become burnt offerings, to give their lives in dedication to him. He actually wants our minds so that he can do something with them, that he might be glorified in us. No, do we, do we actually think that, that we will be manifestations of God in the kingdom age, in the kingdom age without learning the principles of self-sacrifice for God now, without learning the principles of God manifest in the flesh? And when it comes to this question, will a man rob God? You know, it's really a devastating question because it's one which every one of us should ask ourselves. Because... It can be done so easy. It can be done just through selfishness. It can be done through ignorance. Or it may be done through outright negligence. And that's what these people displayed here in Malachi's time. You know, our first study, we made the point that throughout the book of Malachi, these people were charged with three major sins. The first being ignorance in chapter 1, verse 6. They didn't put their noses in the word often enough. The second was being indifference in, in chapter 1, verse 13. And the third now is in verse 8, self-seeking. So now in verse 8, they say to him, wherein have we robbed thee? Verse 8, Where wherein have we robbed thee? So there's the seventh query, revealing their ignorance and their lack of understanding. How can you say that we've robbed God when we go to the temple and we offer sacrifices? Now we might breathe a sigh of relief and say, well, thank goodness that doesn't affect us because we don't have to tithe anymore, and we don't have to offer animal sacrifices. But it's not really that, that easy, actually. Tithes actually represents self-sacrifice. Offerings, strong tells us, means a heave offering. Some part of the peace offering, and it represents fellowship with God on the basis of surrendering something to God. So it represents... The work of a man's hands given in service to God 
So that principle applies to every generation of God's people. Now, they thought that the law of Moses simply required a ritual form of religion, which according to Malachi, they couldn't even get that right because they offered the halt, the blind and the lame. Now, we've got a very interesting point here, actually, because in Deuteronomy 12, verse 11, we read, There shall be a place which Yahweh Elohim shall choose to cause his name to dwell there. Thither shall you bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings, your tithes, and the heave offering of your hand. So the tithes and the heave offerings are spoken of together. And it's the only passage that I know of where they are spoken together exactly as they are in Malachi 3 verse 8. Only twice in the whole of scripture are they spoken of together. And the reason is that the heave offering was similar to the tithes in that it was a tribute that was presented to the priests of the sanctuary to be eaten by the offerer and the priest. So we, we see here a sharing together of fellowship with God. And how important is that? To fellowship with God in our life and the truth. Mere outward rituals are of very little value unless the true spirit of the truth is there, motivating the action that is done. So is there any wonder then in verse 9 that God pronounces this curse upon this generation? In verse 9 he says, Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole generation. Now that's the curse, goes back to Deuteronomy 27 and verse 28. The Jerusalem Bible says, the curse lies on you. So they were doomed. Basically, just about the whole ecclesia, bar a very few people, the whole ecclesia had gone astray. So in verse 10, God then pleads with them again, just as he had done in verse 7. He pleads with them. And that's exactly what the Lord had promised them. Remain faithful to the covenant and you'll never want from a blessing for, from Almighty God. Now, what wonderful words they are. And, and that principle applies equally to us. Strive to remain faithful to your covenant relationship with our God. Maintain our integrity, our honesty, despite our weaknesses and our failings. Remain dedicated to the way of the truth. He will never forsake us. So here's Yahweh's appeal. He says to them, bring the tithes into the storehouse. Move me now herewith. Now the Jerusalem Bible we read in verse 10, bring the tithes in full to the treasury so that there is food in my house. Put me to the test now like this, says Yahweh Sabaoth, and see if I do not open the floodgates of heaven for you and pour out an abundant blessing for you. Now prove in the King James Version, means to test or examine. That's why the Jerusalem Bible says, put me to the test now. So God's saying to them, if you've got any doubts, put me to the test. In other words, he's saying to them, if you perform your responsibilities to me, you will never find me lacking in my attitude toward you. And they are words of comfort for us that dominate the book of, Yahweh, uh, book of Malachi. He says, I am Yahweh, I change not. Prove me. Put me to the test and I will call out a blessing. The word pour in, is rendered empty in Genesis 42 verse 35 and it's like God saying to us, I will empty myself out for you. I will withhold no good thing from those who love me and honour me, ha me and have respect and reverence to my truth. So we come to verse 11 and we read there, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith Yahweh of armies. And in verse 12, And all nations shall call you blessed. So verse 11 is a direct reference to the law of Moses, a direct reference to the blessings that would come upon them in the day when they are converted to Christ in Messiah's kingdom. And more than that, he says in verse 12, All nations shall call you blessed. That will happen when Israel learns faithfulness and obedience, when they learn to manifest the qualities of spiritual life which they will do in the kingdom age. Then finally all nations, all nations shall call them blessed and in the future age the Gentiles together with Israel are going to be blessed upon that principle. But look what else it says there in verse 12. He says, 
for you shall be a delightsome land, saith Yahweh Sabbath, a delightsome land. In the days of Malachi, did Yahweh take delight in the land or what was happening in it? Well, obviously not. But he says to them, ye shall become a delightsome land and a people to bring delight and pleasure to both God and man. So he will remember every single faithful son and daughter. He will, not, he will neglect not one, and he will forsake not one. So verses 13, 14, and 15 then draws together all the state of the nation, despite all Yahweh's goodness toward them, despite the love that he had shown towards them. We find in verse 13 that we read, verse 13, your words have been stout against me. The word stout means very strong or harsh. So he says to them, you've been very strong and very harsh in your criticism of me without any grounds whatsoever. And yet, verse 13, once again they challenge him. Yet ye say, what have we spoken so much against thee? Well, verse 14, he gives them the answer. He says in verse 14, ye have said it is vain to serve God. Now it's not so much that they literally went around saying that to each other, but their way of life demonstrated that it was a waste of time to serve Yahweh. They could see nothing that they could actually gain from it because they didn't understand the truth, they were ignorant of the fundamental principles of divine worship, and they had no vision of the future glory to come, of which Malachi is going to speak in the most absolutely glorious language in the concluding words of his book in chapter 4, which we will cover by way of exhortation. Not tonight, we haven't got time. So verse 15 says, to these people, this ecclesia, he says, you've now reached the stage where you call the proud happy. Yea, they that work wickedness are set up. Yea, they that tempt God are even delivered. Jerusalem Bible renders verse 15, in fact, we now call the proud the happy ones. The evildoers are the ones who prosper. They put God to the test and yet come to no harm. So they, their way of life demonstrated that they thought they can get away with whatever they want because you can tempt God and there will be no repercussions. Now you imagine a people who demonstrated those characteristics and it's against that background that suddenly there's this absolutely wonderful verse, verse, verse 16. Verse 16 we read, Then they that feared Yahweh spake often one to another, and Yahweh hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared Yahweh and that thought upon his name. Now that's absolutely a wonderful verse. It's a reminder that in the midst of that apostate nation, an ecclesia that had declined to hear the sharp and the strong and yet loving exhortation of the prophet, prophet Malachi, there was still a faithful remnant as there has been in every age. And the, the beautiful thing that comes through from that verse is that while this was the attitude and the, the behavioural pattern of the faithful sons and daughters of God, you know, for me those are two of the most thrilling and probably the most comforting words that certainly in recent times I have read in Scripture, to be, well, actually be found anywhere in Scripture. Yahweh hearkened. You see what that's saying to us? It's saying that Yahweh is neither deaf nor blind to the faithfulness of his sons and his daughters. You know, I've tried to emphasise, and what Malachi tries to emphasise, and we've done throughout these studies, is that Yahweh will never forsake us as long as we have a disposition that is in harmony with his words. Despite our failings and our shortcomings and our weaknesses, which we all pray that in the end he will overlook and forgive, despite our own weaknesses, because that's the attitude of God, Yahweh hearken. Now wonderful words. So those who cling tenaciously to the principles of the truth, often under very great pressure, they can be comforted to know that Yahweh watches over them intently. We know that he sees all, that he hears all, and that he will fully vindicate and justify all those who stand uncompromisingly in defence of his truth. So we're told in verse 16, he hearkened and heard it, Yahweh hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before 
him for them that feared Yahweh and that thought upon his name. So we're told that this book of remembrance is written for those who feared Yahweh and thought upon his name. You know, we all sometimes sit down and think about things, don't we? Whatever those things may be, we ponder things at times. Well, the thought here is the primary root word meaning to think or to meditate. Jacinius says the primary idea seems to be that of computing or reckoning, and it indicates a deep meditation and deep thought. So these people, in verse 16, they thought about the things of God, and they were able, in a sense, to compute and reckon in their minds all the things that God had placed on record and all the things that he would do for those who were faithful. So in the divine name, this faith minority took comfort because they saw in that divine name a promise of their ultimate deliverance. He who will be, or he who will become. And we know that means he who will become a vast multitude of all the redeemed, because the name of God, Yahweh, is representative of his purpose. So in verse 17, more words of comfort for them. He says now, they shall be mine, in verse 17. Aren't they wonderful words? So those of verse 6 shall it's an astonishing statement when you really think and meditate about, upon what it means. They shall be mine in that day when I make up my jewels. They shall be mine, reading from Rosalind's verse 17. They shall be mine, saith Yahweh of hosts, in the day for which I am preparing treasure. And I will deal tenderly with them, just as a man dealeth tenderly with his own son who is serving him. So Yahweh is more accurate. He says, in the day which I am preparing treasure. So the wonderful thing that about, about that is that from the days of Abel, onwards down through history, through the days of Malachi, right up into our own day, God is busy preparing that treasure. It's no matter that brethren may be scorned and isolated, possibly at times, by the world about them. No matter that at times they've had to stand alone in defence of divine principles. God is preparing them. The phrase, my jewels, is, is quite an interesting one. Young's literal says, a peculiar treasure. But the Jerusalem Bible, I believe, has got it so right, it says, my own special possession. So the jewels Yahweh talks about are the personal, his own personal private possession. We're the possession of Almighty God because those jewels are for his name and for his glory and for his purpose and not for any other. So they're separated from the world at large. We're a treasure that the world at large really knows nothing about. So God says here he will spare them. He will spare those who have that attitude to those in verse 16, who have that attitude and that disposition. He says, they shall be mine and I will spare them. And, and Ron, Rotherham renders it, it, it very beautifully here when he says, and I believe that's the most literal translation, when he renders it, I will deal tenderly with them. Tenderly means he will be very mild, he'll be very gentle. You know, brothers and sisters, in all the trials and tribulations of life, when we may not have been treated too tenderly by some others, when we've had to stand on our own integrity before the things of God, and we've had to speak often one to another with those who are like-minded, what a wonderful thing to look forward to, that we will soon, very soon, come to a time when God will deal very tenderly with us, as a father does with a child that he loves. So upon that note, Malachi then turns back to the nation. Verse 18. Then shall ye return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. So eight times throughout this book they've challenged God when he tries to reason with them. Eight times they've turned upon God and they say, where have we gone wrong? What have we done wrong? Because they didn't understand, they were in ignorance. They were indifferent to the instruction that Malachi gave them, indifferent to the time that is about to come upon us. But he says to them there, when you will learn to discern 
Discern is a primary root word, means literally to see. So Rotherham says, so shall you return and see the difference finally. See the difference between the righteous and the lawless. You know, brothers and sisters, the greatest problem in ecclesial life today is precisely that word, discern. It's the greatest problem in the ecclesial world. It's the greatest weakness that is so apparent within our community in these last difficult times of the Gentiles. We have two major problems affecting the ecclesia in the last days. The influence of an evil and an apostate environment and the influence of false teachers, in which very often, sadly, brethren seem to have an inability to discern clearly what is right and what is wrong. They just don't have the ability to discern what is right and what is wrong. Then, then possibly when they do make a decision to do what is right, they have an inability to then stand uncompromisingly in defence of the truth. And it's becoming harder and harder to do that as the pressures of life bear in upon us. But in the very last days, God said that will be the case. Do not despair. Our God will never forsake us. May it be our lot, brothers and sisters, that we may be there in that day when of Israel it is said that it is now a delightsome land, a delight to God and man, that we may be numbered among those who have feared Yahweh and spoken one, often one to another, those who Yahweh has hearkened unto and have our names written in that book of remembrance that Yahweh is in the process of compiling. And, and if, we, if we think about that process, he was compiling it in the days of Malachi. I believe in our days, he's on the very last page, possibly the last column of that book. He won't be compiling it for very much longer. We don't have much time. May we learn that process and develop it in our lives now that we might be found worthy of a place with our Lord and King to administer in that glorious kingdom in the age soon to dawn. Thank you.